sandwiched between two famous kings, his father John and his son Edward. He is the forgotten ruler of the 13th century. His reign was long and not beaten until George III. So follow me as we explore the tumultuous reign of Henry III. Let's get stuck in. It is 1216, and young Henry, a boy of just nine years of age, has just been crowned King of England, third of his name, and the kingdom is in chaos. Administration in the kingdom has pretty much collapsed, and revenue wasn't coming Henry's way. Forces led by the Capitan Prince Louis of France still hold London and surrounding areas. It wasn't just the French who held London, but rebel forces led by Robert Fitzwalter and up the north you had Eustace de Vesey. These were proving a thorn. They had pretty much taken the rest of the kingdom. Only a handful of domains were left, including Gloucester. And at Gloucester, all those still loyal to the throne had gathered at the turning of the tide. And the venerable William Marshall, protector of the king, had just won the first battle of his new reign, sending forces to drive off the Welsh that had besieged his castle at Goodrich. Dangerously close, just 18 miles away, but they had been crushed. Morale certainly needed a boost, and here it was. Talks of a new uprising by the rebels was in the air, and decisions had to be made. Four powerful men held the backbone to the kingdom. William Marshall, Earl of Pembroke, he'd come out of military retirement to win back the kingdom. After all, aside from Henry, he was the most powerful man there was. The Marshal was effectively in charge to act as guardian of the realm and regent until Henry reached his majority. There was Ranulf de Blonville, Earl of Chester, who'd sworn an oath to defend the kingdom. He was the man that the Marshal wanted as regent, as he was younger and equally storied. Both these powerful men were martyr lords, magnates who controlled the Welsh borders. There was Peter de Roche, the fighting Bishop of Winchester, a quite controversial figure. He was no doubt envious he wasn't fighting alongside the knights, but his duty was best served at court in the political arena. And then there was Guala Piccieri, a cardinal and papal legend that had become embroiled in all this chaos. He'd only been dispatched to prevent Louis of France from invading English soil. The invasion had been deemed illegal, as Henry was innocent of John's sins. Alas, the invasion was in full swing, and the seasoned cardinal was determined to see young Henry see his reign as king. There were, of course, others, but I'd rather not bog you down with lists. These four men are the most important. Peter de Roche was given charge to get the young king to safety and headed for Bristol, the most safest city for the boy. These two were already well acquainted, the bishop being one of Henry's mentors since the boy was around four. And once the king was safely away in Bristol, the marshal began to plan how to regain the kingdom. The baronial rebels had taken some losses over the recent months, including Geoffrey de Mandeville, who had died overseas in a French tournament. But the real blow had been in the late summer. Eustace de Vesey had been allied with the teenage King of Scotland, Alexander II. The North effectively belonged to de Vesey, 
However, the two were decided to lay siege to Bernard Castle in County Durham. But the castle belonged to Hugh de Balliol, who defended it with his all. And in the ongoing siege, Eustace de Vesey was struck in the head with an arrow. He probably died instantly. The barons were on a losing streak, and the marshal decided that Louis was the greatest threat, but they still didn't have the forces to fight him. It would be better to choose a political approach, politics that would involve the rebel barons. It was time to resurrect the Magna Carta. No mere peace treaty, a whole different beast. This 1216 version had only 40 clauses rather than the 63. Shorter and more focused, tailored to everybody's liking, taking out all the clauses that rendered it null and void before and get Henry to sign it willingly, a freely given assurance of rights. And the royal faction needed to get as many rebels back on board as possible. Cardinal Bicieri, as a papal legend, spoke with the authority of the Pope and this one would not get annulled. So two weeks after the coronation, Vigieri and William Marshall called a council in Bristol. It had to be Bristol, as that's where the king currently resided. And on St. Martin's Day, 11th of November, four earls, 11 bishops and a gathering of barons held court in front of the young king. Here, they would reissue the Great Charter as well as the marshal getting sworn in as regent to the king. He took the title guardian. Like many times before, very few were willing to oppose this legendary knight. Even at 70, he was formidable. A number of rebels had already swayed back to the royal cause. Hubert de Burr was also there, the Castellan of Dover, who'd held out against the French for a month. He was still technically under siege, but Prince Louis the Dauphin had allowed him to attend the Bristol meeting. And Hubert de Burr would continue as Justicia. Not that Louis had much of a choice in the matter. His viceroy, Inigrand de Coche, had switched sides in support of the young King Henry, rather than suffer excommunication from Cardinal Pichieri. Louis had since retreated back to London, concentrating his efforts on the Midlands. Buggered over. The Marshal let the French take a string of castles as they retreated to London. They could have the castles, they'd never have the kingdom. Those present at Bristol first passed the Charter of Liberties, then on the second day the new approved charter was confirmed and seals were pressed. Once again Magna Carta was legal, this time it would stay. The king hadn't yet got a seal, so the marshal and Guala used theirs in his stead. Hmm? Henry was not a rich king, and was only able to gain tax from a small part of the kingdom. The rest of the tax revenue was taken up by Prince Louis, who was still considered to be king by the rebel barons. Other barons had gone rogue and were taking the revenue for themselves. There was also the case of his father's, John's, mercenaries. There were many outstanding debts to these soldiers that required paying, and royal outposts were also in need of funding. With the financial administration in ruins, it came to the marshal to try and fix things. He orders the liquidation of the old treasuries of King John, and moves all the finances to three castles. Corfe Castle in Devon, Devizes Castle in Wiltshire, and Dover Castle in Kent. It became apparent during these talks at Bristol that if they were going to wage war against the rebels and the French, the kingdom would soon be penniless, and Prince Louis claim to the throne would be uncontested. No, the marshal needed a swift, decisive strike one victory to win the conflict. The war itself seemed to be dying down. 
No more sacking the countryside. No more burning towns. People were settling where they were, more or less. Including Louis, the Dauphin of France. He'd been securing his hold on the southeast of England. Apart from Dover proving stubborn, and now venturing into the Midlands, the focus switched from tackling Louis to tackling the rebels. Reconciliation was key in the eyes of the papacy, who also wished the kingdom united. As Christmas approached, Pope Honorus demanded that the rebel barons swear fealty to King Henry. But the coronation solidified Henry as the true king. Anyone else is a usurper. The Pope gave Cardinal Guadalupe orders to look after John's children. And so he did. And a truce at Christmas, through to January, saw a real break in the war. But peace itself couldn't have looked further out of reach, of both sides laying claim to the throne. The Barons' War was becoming another anarchy. At Christmas, the young Henry remained at Bristol, enjoying his time as king. Lavish feasts, gifts, and the splendour of the church festivities, becoming fast friends with his new regent, the guardian William Marshall, and Gualabicieri, people with power, people with money. Henry still had his old tutors, Roger de St. Samson and Philip de Albany, never quitting his military training. There was a development in the new year as councils were hosted in Oxford and Cambridge. Yes, both royalist and rebel met in peace. Diplomacy, discussion. Marshall and Piccieri putting the case forward. The case being, Henry was king. Magna Carta was reissued and their fealty to Louis was waning. French supplies were low and Louis' taxation was too high. Marshall promised to wipe the slate clean, all part offences forgiven. More swayed to the royal banner. Add to this, Robert Fitzwalter himself was faltering. Louis had captured one of Fitzwalter's castles and refused to hand it over. If Fitzwalter betrayed his homeland, says Louis, then he simply could not be trusted. Of course, Fitzwalter wasn't going to join the royal court, but there was hope in the eyes of the Marshal and Cardinal Bicieri. And barons, who did abandon the rebel cause and swear fealty to King Henry, did so without any punishment or retribution. It was all water under the bridge. Records called them the Returners, or the Reversi, as they had literally reversed their political position. The most famous of the Reversi was William Longsby, who had abandoned King John, but now joined his son Henry. Gualabicieri was also trying to wangle this war effort as a kind of crusade. The Royalist faction would even wear the crusading cross on their clothing, indicating that this was a holy war. A holy war led by William Marshall. After all, the king had the papal blessing, and Gualo was a papal legend. He was in direct contact with Pope Honorius. He made sure the clergy were firmly behind King Henry, all the way from England to across the Irish Sea. What's more, the Welsh princes found themselves placed under an interdict by Gualo forcing them out of the war. And then the barons controlling the sink ports switched to Henry, something Louis feared greatly. And all the while, the Pope was concocting a marriage between Henry and another princess, but this wouldn't come to anything. Guala pretty much had the power to replace any bishop swearing loyalty to Louis, furthering Henry's position. And the French Dauphin, Louis, was in a hell of a pickle. At this point, Louis actually requested a truce. Seeing his support waning, he'd originally wanted to return to France to get reinforcements, but the loss of the sink ports prevented this. Worse, he was continuously attacked 
by counter-rebellion from a band of longbowmen led by Willikin of the Wild. Even as Louis got as far as Winchester, Willikin harassed the French mercilessly, breaking bridges and fighting a guerrilla war. Uh, they'd been doing it all the way through John's campaign and now Henry's. And at Winchelsea, the population destroyed their own mills in a scorched earth tactic before boarding their many boats and fleeing. Louis was buggered. He spent two weeks in the town, his men going hungry, before being alleviated by ships from London and Boulogne. However, in France, there was another development. King Philip Augustus was also in agreement with the papacy, that Henry was the king. And this invasion into England was illegal, illogical and unwise. If his son was one day to rule France, he'd better buck his ideas up. King Philip recalled his unruly son back to Paris on February 1217. Prince Louis did so immediately, harassed by the outlaw band of guerrilla archers, led by Willikin of the Wild as they went. He even escaped a plot by the Marshal to capture him. Of course, he gets to France by the help of Eustace the Monk, a famous pirate of the era. Despite all of this, Louis was back in Paris. There, he was told to make peace with England, as he didn't have the backing from France anymore. This is exactly what Henry needed, and his regent, the Marshal, sprang into action, raising funds, yes, via tax, but to help restore order. All the way through spring, the Marshal reinforced the kingdom, should the French return. Fox de Bru, the mercenary who was loyal to the throne, also aided in this, and Willikin of the Wild was made warden of the 700s of the Wild. While Ranulf de Blonville took a castle near Loughborough, and the Marshal sent forces to retake Winchester. Meanwhile, in France, Philip refused to back his son. The invasion was folly, but Louis's wife, Blanche of Castile, considered this defeatist and helped her husband for another invasion of England. This will be much bigger. He'd be the new conqueror. And by April, Louis was back in England with a much larger army. He didn't need the barons or the sink ports. He was aided in his invasion by Sir de Quincy, a rebel, and Eustace the monk the pirate. Also with him was the formidable Thomas, Count of Perche. He headed straight for an old foe, Hubert de Burr at Dover. Ye, unfortunately, he had pretty much the same results as before. Hubert de Burr was proving as stubborn as ever, easily defending his formidable castle. So, once again, Louis abandons the siege and heads to Winchester, pretty much retaking the city while trying to reinforce Dover's leaguer at the same time. This was not good news for the royal faction, and William Marshall gives the command for a scorched earth policy. All minor castles that had been retaken were to be torched. It was a desperate tactic, but had to be done. The exception was Farnham which was currently under siege by the French. There was another problem. Remember that castle in Loughborough, taken by Ranulf de Blonville? That castle is called Mount Sorrel and belonged to Sir de Quincy, the rebel chap currently aiding Louis. Well, he wanted it back and de Quincy wasn't just a low-level knight, he was the Earl of Winchester and the feud between him and de Blonville went way back. Along with Robert Fitzwalter, de Quincy headed north to retake his lands, backed by the French. Hearing the French war machine was approaching, those that held Mount Sorrel abandoned it, fleeing to Nottingham, along with de Blonville, pursued by the French. At Nottingham, they battened down the hatches, reinforcing the castle preparing for the inevitable assault 
The Royalists probably thought that Louis was spearheading the French war machine, but he wasn't. This was Count Persh. And the assault never came. Because further north was Lincoln. The castle had been under siege for quite some time, defended by the elderly widow Nicola de la Haye, who had already fended off more than her fair share of besiegers by this point. This is where Count Persh would throw his forces. But Nicola was having none of it. The army, led by Count Persh, along with Sayer de Quincy and Robert Fitzwater, were throwing everything at the castle. And its defeat was only a matter of time. Soon the city walls fell, forcing the defenders to retreat back to the castle itself. Defeat was only a matter of time. By now, the royal faction was already on the move, and in Northampton, on the 12th of May, the legendary William Marshall caught wind of the siege of Lincoln Castle. In response, he rallied all he could muster at Newark on the 15th. The Royal Army wasn't small, probably about 2,500 men, 400 knights, 300 crossbowmen, and a large contingent of men at arms. This number also includes the retainers, squires, etc., and the wagon train which trailed behind. Among this force was the Marshal's son, William. Previously a rebel, he was one of the Reversi. Now fighting by his father's side, you had Ranulf de Blonville, William Longsby. Then there was the Bishop of Winchester, Peter de Roche, just itching to get back into the action. Among them were many less other names. Apparently, Ranulf de Blonville refused to fight unless he was placed in the vanguard and got to deliver the first blow. And the Marshal himself was 70, an elderly man who had long retired from war, his armour and lance now relics of a younger man. But he was the embodiment of chivalry, and the kingdom was at stake. At last, the near-mythical knight, even at his age, donned his mail. His sword was an old friend. He mounted his steed, and led his army north in the hope that Lady Nicola still held out. She was at her darkest hour. Holed up in the castle, she could only watch as the French brought their siege engines forward, encamping in the city. Should any relief force arrive, they would be encountered by the French holding the city walls. The royal forces were considerably outnumbered. Count Persh's men-at-arms alone numbered almost yet about 2,000 of them. Add to this 600 knights, and then add the forces of the rebels. They considerably outnumbered the royals. This wasn't going to be an easy battle. And before setting off, the marshal had divided his army up into four battles. The van was led by Ranoff de Blonville. The second division was led by the marshal himself. William Longsby would take the 3rd Division. Last of all, Peter de Rocher would take the 4th Division. A 5th contingent of skirmishing crossbowmen would scout ahead, led by Fawkes de Brew. At Torsky, they heard Mass, then set up, each division taking a different route, forming a cordon around the heavily defended city. The besiegers had now become the besieged. Say de Quincy and Fitzwalter had noticed the skirmishing scouts. They most likely thought this was the wagon train, but reckoned the rest of the army was near, so shut the gates and prepared for battle. The second division arrived from the south, led by the marshal. It takes all day to set up a leaguer. He tries negotiation with Count Persh, but gets nowhere. They considered Louis as king and believed that they would defeat this outnumbered royal army. After all, they had the advantage. They had the city walls. But when asked why William Marshall isn't attacking, the Marshal explains that de Blondeville is coming from the north and he's basically called Dibs. And soon, Ranulf de Blondeville's van appeared and began besieging the north side of the city. 
Though oddly, they didn't seem to bring any of the siege equipment from Nottingham. They were probably expecting to drive off a sieging army, and were surprised to find the French safely behind Lincoln's walls. Count Persh was less than impressed, and taunted the dwarf of a man that had given him the slip at Mount Sorrel. And there was no doubt other insults thrown Ranulph's way. I wonder if Count Persh is any relation to John Cleese. Around the 19th of May, the Royal Army attacked. Ranulph used battering rams and ladders in an attempt to assault the city. However, Peter de Roche had devised a sneaky plan. For he reckoned that Count Persh and the others had in fact mistaken Falk de Brut's crossbowmen at a baggage train. This was fantastic! The bishop was also aware of a sally port, a secret gate unknown to Count Persh. The bishop sent Falk de Brut and his company of crossbowmen through the gate to join with Nicholas Garrison, while de Blondeville succeeded in breaching the city walls and taking the north gate. The royal army began pouring through. Oddly, the French didn't react to this and focused on the siege of the castle itself, where Nicola was still holding out. It was a three-way siege sandwich. The royal forces were pouring in and the rebels held firm, no one giving quarter, a pitched battle erupting in the north part of the city and fierce fighting from both sides. For seven long hours, the battle raged on in the tightly packed streets. Swordsmen could not swing a sword and bowmen couldn't string an arrow. This was how one chronicler described it. Exhausted men retreated down side roads and alleys only to find more battle. And there was no way out for the rebels. Slowly, the rebel army was beaten back to the castle walls, which Nicola de Hay still held. Emboldened by the turning of the tide, Lady Nicola then decides to rally her defenders and sally forth out of the castle gate, taking the enemy in the rear. Fox de Bru decides to order his men to climb the rooftops, raining crossbow bolts upon the rebels as they desperately fought for their lives. The rebels had the numbers, but this advantage was now lost. Count Persh was given quarter, a chance to put down arms and surrender, but he refused, fighting on. But the only avenue of retreat was south, as they had not yet taken the castle. Gradually, they were beaten back. And what begun as an easy siege was turning into a rout. The French, though, were far from defeated and fought on until the last Alas, Thomas, Count of Persh, would not survive, being cut down, dying sword in hand. Sir de Quincey was captured, as was Robert de Fitzwalter, a blow to the rebel cause. Many rebels were captured, including de Blonville's own nephews. Only about three noble rebels had died in this. It's a pretty bloodless battle, as far as the nobles were concerned. 400 knights were captured including 25 signatories of John's Magna Carta. Two rebels had escaped, William de Manville and John de Lessie, giving the royals the slip. Only three French nobles escaped, joining the rebels in their flight to London. Lincoln was saved. And by the summer, this battle was to be coined the Fair of Lincoln. As relatively few noble deaths had occurred, as compared to other battles, and it was the aristocracy who were doing the name in. As for the peasantry, many had died in the rout. No doubt the marshal wanted to push on, deliver the final blow and end this war once and for all. But his four divisions were unwieldy and hard to keep in place. As for the rebels, the marshal holds councils at Oxford and Chertsey and around 150 others now switched to the royal cause. Stability was returning to the kingdom. The rebellion, and thus the Barons' War, was truly over. There was still the French, who still held London. They tried again to take Dover to no avail, and by June their position looked desperate, and their defeat was only a matter of time. In other news, on the 12th of June, the Archbishop of Tyr had arrived to preach the Fifth Crusade. Pope Honorius 
needed, all he could muster for this new attempt to wrest the kingdom of Jerusalem from the Islamic faith. These talks also opened new avenues of discussion. While peace was being negotiated, unfortunately Louis was being stubborn to a fault and making impossible demands. But the French position, if they had one, was further damaged when the Pope declared aid to be raised to England to help Henry rebuild the kingdom. He also suggested that Ranulf de Blonville be joint regent alongside the Marshal. On a cynical note, making Blonville co-regent was wise, as William Marshall was an old man. He had his wits, but he wasn't immortal. The saints were already knocking on his door. Fortunately, he'd always been out. Then, in August, Louis the Pretender decides on one last throw of the dice. A bold plan. For Eustace the Monk, a fallen clergyman turned pirate, who played both sides, had slipped to Calais to make contact with Blanche of Castile, the wife of Prince Louis. There, she had raised a hundred knights and hundreds of men at arms, including Guillaume de Bar and Robert of Courtenay, a Flemish knight and son of the Emperor of Constantinople. Eustace captained the command ship, a cog named the Great Ship of Beyond. And on the 23rd of August, the eve of St. Bartholomew's, Eustace sailed from Calais with a great fleet of around 70 ships ferrying these reinforcements. Once again, the Marshal saw what was coming and quickly headed to New Romney in Kent to rally the Cinque Ports to gather a fleet in order to counter the French. He placed Hubert de Burr in command, along with Philip de Omni, the King's military tutor. Unfortunately, at such short notice, the Marshal could muster not more than 40 ships, almost half the French number. Worse, the English ships were smaller, save the command ship, a cog that mashed Eustace's own. Still, the English held the Singapore's, and the only way for Eustace's fleet to approach London was through Sandwich. <laughs> Enough jokes, he is sniggering. Hmm? Right. Sandwich wasn't just a regular town like it is today. Here's a map. You see, there's an estuary, a strait, allowing you to pretty much travel between Kent and the Isle of Thanet. And this is the route Eustace took on his way to the Thames. Unfortunately, the English saw this coming and the fleet was ready to pounce. Hubert de Burr waited. He'd suffered enough of Louis's lip. He knew Louis would be back besieging Dover in no time. Now it was his turn to counter-strike. He waited for the French fleet to pass by. Then he struck. Only a feint, but it was enough to goad Robert de Courtenay into committing his part of the fleet. As soon as he did, the English fleet pounced on him. Archers on ships' towers began inflicting many casualties, as well as a lion, which headed downwind and blinded the fleet. But de Burr had another target in mind. His cog was a match for Eustace's Bayonne, so he pulled up beside it and boarded it. To his luck, he discovered that the French command ship was overloaded with siege supplies, including a trebuchet. They had many horses. There was no fight, only slaughter. While the French, such as Guillaume de Bar, and the Flemish, such as Robert de Courtenay, were ransomed off, there was no such mercy for the pirate captain. Eustace had hidden in the bilge, and when dragged out by the English, he offered, in desperation, 10,000 marks for his freedom. It fell on deaf ears, and this traitor was marked for execution. At first they suggested death by trebuchet. No, not flinging him across the Thames on a catapult. Uh, this punishment, called trebuchet, was more like a duck in the But instead they decided to make it quick. And a man named Stephen Crabb struck him over the head, killing him instantly. But with such losses, the French fleet broke. And it was every man for himself on their flight back to France. Many French on the captured vessels fled for safety 
jumping off ship and running to the hills. The battle was over. No doubt thinking God was on his side, young Henry, still only nine, decides to join battle himself, risking all and joining a marshal on his march to London. There, the king himself laid siege to London. King Henry, alongside his venerable regent, met Prince Louis outside the gates of London on the 29th of August. And by the 5th of September, amnesty was agreed at Kingston. A week later, at his home in Lambeth, Stephen Langton, the Archbishop of Canterbury, back from Rome, finalised peace, signed by the legit Gwala. All French captives were released, with no further threat of punishment, and no ransoms. But all Louis's English castles were to be handed over to Henry. Also, Louis was given 10,000 marks to bribe his father on restoring some of King John's continental territory. There are also other clauses, but I'm not going to get into the details. Henry will con contest these later. But most of all, London was back under royal control. Henry had his kingdom. He had won a war that he had no part in starting. And thus, a new period began in English history. A reign that began with a charter of liberties, limiting his power. But Henry's problems were only just beginning.